Hello, it's Scott Manley here. This morning, I woke up to my phone buzzing with a lot of messages saying, Hey, Scott, you got to talk about the Vulcan launch anomaly. So for those of you who haven't been paying attention, ULA were performing the second test flight of their Vulcan rocket. Originally, it had been intended that this would fly with Sierra's Dream Chaser, but unfortunately that's been delayed and they really want to get to their military contracts, so they performed a launch with a mass simulator. Immediately after launch, everything looked great. Now, it's propelled by two BE-4 engines from Blue Origin, burning methane and liquid oxygen, and in this case, it had two extra solid rocket motors, GEM 63 XL engines. And if you look carefully, there's something that's not quite right with the plume. And if you're having a hard time telling that from a regular rocket plume, there, that's all the evidence you need. Something was definitely going wrong. And a switch to another camera angle makes it very obvious that the solid rocket motor on the right has a much wider exhaust plume. And I'm going to say when I first saw this footage, I didn't actually know whether this flight had been a success or not. I didn't even know if it had made it to space. I just knew that it was still going and I fully expected that solid rocket motor to just unzip and destroy the entire stack. But... The rocket made it to space. The second stage has apparently put it into a perfect orbit. But from this angle, you can see that the, the plumes from both of those boosters are different. And the one which is narrow, that is producing the full thrust in the correct direction. The one that is wide, that is losing thrust. And so the whole booster is being turned towards the poor uh, engine. Therefore, the core is having to f you know, gimbal its rocket nozzles to keep itself flying straight. There is onboard guidance and navigation software which is having to compensate for this problem in real time. And it's not just keeping the rocket flying straight. It's noticing now that it's lost a little bit of thrust because it's getting less thrust overall. And it is looking at its downrange performance. It's recalculating how it's going to get to orbit and it is you know, initiating corrections. Now at this point the boosters are burned out and according to the top right it should have ejected them at 1 minute and 49 seconds. It's over 2 minutes. I think it's holding on to those boosters a bit longer because they need to land in the drop zone that has been designated downrange. But from this point onwards the odds of success are looking good. That booster had been chained to a crazy out of control booster that had been throwing exhaust and debris in all sorts of directions that it shouldn't. But now the real question is does it have the performance to get to the target orbit? Now we didn't get on screen telemetry in terms of altitudes, velocities, distances, but we did get this display and immediately you can see that this thing is angled upwards more than it should be, right? It's sort of side slipping and trying to lift itself upwards because it didn't get the performance it expected from the initial boost with the, the boosters attached. Um, it, it's trying to make it up so that it is going into an orbit where the Centaur can actually take it successfully. Stage uh, burns out, of course, at the same time because they didn't change the amount of propellant on board. Uh, there does seem to be a small amount of delay getting the Centaur started up according to the timestamps. Like you see it's 5.15 was the estimated time and it was closer to 5.30. I'm not sure that's a real delay. They seem to have like communication problems right around stage separation, which is understandable. There's a lot of like motion and vibration during that. They actually cut away to this shot of the control room. And, you know, I think it's telling how concerned some of these guys look uh, and how passive some of them aren't. But... Look, at this point, they've lobbed it into an orbit, and the Centaur V has huge amounts of performance. Uh, it's much bigger than the previous Centaurs. It has two engines, uh, and you can see that its angle is now much more consistent with the velocity of the, you know, the Earth in the backdrop. And so, yeah, at this point, they have called this a success. It has made it. It's on its way to deep space, but how close did it come to failure is the big question. So now let's rewind, analyze the footage, and see if we can figure out exactly what happened. Now early on you can actually see a lot of debris falling off the rocket. That is ice. That's not part of this failure. There's also, it looks like there's a sort of a bright area running up the side. I think that is also like condensation coming off the side of the rocket. It's not related to the boosters. But this is. This is a plume that appears about 25 seconds in. So, zooming in and slowing down, first of all, it's very hard to tell where the bottom of the rocket is because of the exposure here, but watch for the event uh, as it happens and see how it propagates down the plume as a wave. 
and also if I play this again, it does look initially like there's a sort of blast that goes forward, but I think that what's happening there is as the plume expands out sideways, it's just making the uh, condensation plume from the top of the rocket coming down, making it much, much brighter. So that's not actually a failure forward of the nozzle. It's also difficult to tell the plume shape because you've got entrained flow. As the rocket is punching its way through the atmosphere, it's creating a low pressure area behind it, which is sucking in all these exhaust gases and kind of hiding the real geometry of what's going on here. So anyway, returning to the original schedule, yeah, we have the initial burn through about 26 seconds and the gas is now escaping through some route where it was not meant to. That is presumably eroding something until a structural component fails and we get a big blast of sparks. And then it disappears into the cloud, which is actually great because it acts as a filter, lets us see that the nozzle has gone. Like behind the expanding plume, you can see the boat tail and the bottom of the nozzles are supposed to be far below that. So from this angle, it's very clear that the nozzle has gone. And if the official footage wasn't convincing, well, we have lots of people who were there who took some amazing photos. Again, shout out to everyone in the community who takes stunning photos. But the real uh, smoking gun, or rather burning nozzle, is this footage from DY's photography, which captures the whole thing in slow motion, and you can visibly see the bottom of the nozzle just spinning out there. This was working with NASA Spaceflight, by the way, and since they covered the whole thing live, they literally had their conclusions out before the flight had performed its injection into interplanetary space. So these solid rocket motors are built by Northrop Grumman. They're called the GEM 63XL. So GEM stands for Graphite Epoxy Motor. That's another fancy way of saying it is a carbon fiber composite pressure casing. 63 refers to 63 inch diameter, and the baseline GEM 63 was used in the Atlas V starting in 2020. The XL version is five feet longer, and that is used on the Vulcan. So the GEM 63 in the Atlas V produces about 170 tons of thrust for 94 seconds. But stretching the casing actually increases the pressure and the burn rate. The 63 XL produces over 200 tons of thrust for 84 seconds. Now, beyond being five foot longer and having different attach points, I'm not sure there's any other real differences, so it's reasonable to believe that the nozzles on this are the same as on the 63. And so, yeah, they're handling an extra 20% of uh, you know thrust running through this same nozzle. The nozzle is uh, an ablative nozzle. It's made of a phenolic resin composite. That's the same stuff they use on heat shields, but obviously this is structurally able or designed to handle the the thrust, the, the exhaust gases moving through it. And by the way, while this is being sold by Northrop Grumman these days, they it was actually originally developed by Orbital ATK, which was subsequently acquired by Northrop Grumman. And they also make the boosters for SLS. And if you remember a while back, they were performing a test of a large solid rocket booster derived from the space shuttle with a composite ablative nozzle and the nozzle had an anomaly that was for their omega rocket which was competing against the vulcan for our national security launches they never got any they never finished building the rocket as a result but they're still going to be involved in national security launches because they're building the boosters for vulcan anyway let's come back to today's launch so like, obviously, they dodged a bullet here. I mean, literally, when that nozzle let go, they are very lucky that none of the fragments went inwards and damaged the uh, the engines, the BE-4 engines, because if they had lost those, that would have absolutely ended this mission. As it happens, the fragments, whatever way they went, they did not impact the core and damage it. So what they were left with was a loss of thrust. The booster still continued to burn propellant at the same rate as the other one, but the nozzle is designed to sort of focus the exhaust gases in one direction. And so that adds thrust. Without the nozzle working, the gases were going in all directions and they didn't have nearly as much thrust on that side. With the asymmetric thrust as well, the whole rocket would want to tip over towards the weaker engine. And so the core engines would have to gimbal over so they would change their thrust towards the good engine and counteract that torque. There is footage from third parties that show the booster visibly tilting over towards the bad engine. 
And I, I guess they're actually lucky that they were able to keep this straight enough through max Q because if a rocket turns too far away from its velocity, it's sometimes possible that it will tumble because it becomes unstable. So early on in the flight, the guidance is really about keeping the rocket flying in a straight line through the thick atmosphere. Once it's beyond that part of the atmosphere, that's when it can start to perform those trajectory corrections that we saw later. So yeah, there's another thing I want to show you just around stage separation time. So this is after motor burnout. This is just like residual burning that isn't producing thrust. Notice on the right side here, the dead booster is producing more gas and then it just sort of fades away. On the left one, we still have a hot spot that's visible. And I think that flame on the left is really just the exhaust from the core engines impinging on the nozzle which extends further back. That's why you have this sort of asymmetric uh, you know, burnout. Again, it's important to note that they burned out at roughly the same time. If there had been damage to the nozzle, which had made one side bigger than the other, they would have burned at different rates because the pressure inside the uh, booster would have been different. And again, slow motion during stage separation, you can see the left nozzle is interacting with the exhaust from the core, whereas the right missing the nozzle doesn't do that. Anyway, from that point onwards, the booster used its fancy onboard guidance capabilities to redesign the trajectory. It used closed loop guidance to make sure that the booster threw the second stage into a trajectory that gave it enough time to make up for the performance loss. It was supposed to shut down its engines at 15 minutes, 54 seconds. But uh, because of the performance loss, it was able to burn for an extra 20 seconds and get into its initial parking orbit. And from there, uh, it launched into its target trajectory, apparently with enough precision that uh, ULA were very happy with it. Now, we did get some uh, post-flight commentary from a rocket scientist and CEO of ULA, Tori Bruno. And of course, he was um, you know, very careful with the choice of his language used to describe this event. Yeah, so the trajectory was nominal throughout. We came to our uh, first insertion in the orbit that we intended, so all of that is good. We did, however, have an observation on SRB number one, and so we will be off looking into that after the mission is complete. Yes, an observation. I, look, you know, I understand how business speak works, and this is totally normal. Uh, but yeah, ULA are, of course, in the process of potentially being sold to a buyer. And understandably, there's a lot of sensitive negotiations and, and questions about future performance. This mission was supposed to demonstrate that the Vulcan was good for Space Force missions going forwards. And Space Force were congratulating ULA and saying they will look at the data and decide where they go from here. Uh, now, I'm going to say, since the problem was with the the a booster, the GEM-63, the Vulcan, which has no solid boosters, is totally viable, I would say, in my mind. But I'm pretty sure they're going to want to understand what went wrong with the booster and make sure it doesn't happen again. Northrop Grumman have been building these boosters for a while. They have a bunch sitting around waiting for launches. And when they figure out what went wrong with this one, they're going to have to go back and make sure that none of the ones that have been built already are going to have the same defect. And of course, the FAA is going to require an investigation. And yes, that means the rocket will be grounded, although to be grounded, you would have to have a bunch of regular launches going on. Anyway, let's uh, think a little more about how this failure might have happened, assuming that the nozzle came off after a burn through. So this is the nozzle from a GEM-63 or 63XL. I'm not sure how different it is. You can see the bottom of the booster there with all the pins that are used to lock it into the bottom of the casing. It narrows down to the throat and then it changes color as you go up into this nozzle section. Again, that's the section where it's largely made of this resin which is designed to ablate. Right, so as the hot gases impinge on it, it releases its own hot gases and produces an insulating layer. And it slowly burns through, but by the time it burns all the way through, it's supposed to have finished doing its whole rocket thing. So yeah, the best footage we have shows a complete ring, very similar in size to the bottom or the sort of the rightmost section of this nozzle in this frame, uh, spinning and falling away. So that was intact. There was a catastrophic failure somewhere between the nozzle and the end of this. Now, there's an initial burn through and the most logical place for that is at the interface between the, you know, this two different sections here. You see how there's a bunch of rivets or whatever there. 
making connecting those two things is critical. You have the highest pressures or the highest velocities. A lot of energy is flowing through this, and any tiny crack will be very quickly ablated away, and you can have a burnout through the side. And given that you have these hot gases flowing through, once you have like a pit, the pit can burn through uh, and all the way through. It can then start escaping out the side, expanding the size, and that will quickly run all the way around until it has a like a circumferential failure. And that leads to an overpressure event, which cracks the top of the nozzle and the whole thing falls off. I think that's what happened here, and I think the separation line is literally visible in this. In the cases I've heard of when you've got an ablative nozzle failure, it tends to start as an imperfection on the inside, which propagates through to the outside. If I had actual telemetry, I might have been able to figure out, you know, performance differences and figure out how much of the nozzle was left. That might have been a clue, but we don't have that. And literally, as I've been making this video, I I'm starting to see cameras that were at the launch site coming back with some glorious photography. Max Evans here bringing the badass looks. And great thing to see here is there is no obvious problem here in terms of uh, burn through at this early moment in the flight. The rocket is doing its thing and looking good, unaware of what's going to happen next. And while we know what happened next on this specific flight, we don't know what is going to happen next to Vulcan as a launch vehicle and ULA in general. We know there's going to be an investigation. We don't know what the results will be. And we don't know when the next launch of Vulcan might be. But I hope it is super uh, sooner rather than later. And of course, once again, congratulations to the launch team for handling this like a boss and putting that payload where it was supposed to go. I'm Scott Manley, fly safe.